Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Everybody wants their life to, to mean something. Everybody wants their life to have an impact on something, to make a difference. So what does it take uh, for one's life to make a difference? Does it take brains? <clears throat> does it take uh, uh, high degree of intelligence? Does it take uh, the right physique? The right physical body? Uh, does it take the right kind of clothes and the right kind of jewelry? Well, certainly not. We know better than that, don't we? To make a difference in our lives has nothing to do with that. Uh, today we're going to complete the series of messages on Joseph. Uh, and Joseph was the young man in the Bible that was sold into slavery by his own brothers and finally wound up to be a, a prime minister of, of Egypt. And we're going to take the last part of his life today, chapter 50 of Genesis. So if you want to, to turn to that in your Bibles, you certainly may do so, because we're going to be reading that, but not all in its entirety, all at one time, in sections. So the question is, is what does it take to make an impact in our world? What's it going to take in, in one's life to make a difference? That's the question we ask today. And uh, I'm going to give you three answers. And all three of these are, are, are biblical. First of all, it's going to take some hardships to grow through. It's going to take some hardships to grow through. Because Joseph certainly had them, did he not? Lots of hardships. He became a mature believer in God through his hardships. <clears throat> Let me read for us the uh, verses 15 on through verse, uh, verse 18. <clears throat> in fact, let me, uh, rather than my reading it, I have a, a bad voice today. I'm chewing cough drops, trying to keep my voice there. So I'm going to have uh, Vicar Joel read verses 15, 16, and 17 to kind of save my voice a little bit. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Joseph wept. Why would, Je why would Joseph weep? Well, those of us who have been here the last six Sundays, uh, and we know the tremendous pain that Joseph went through because of his brothers. See, Joseph had more than his share of problems, and they all began with his brothers. And it went on from there. And you all know, I think, how much hurt there is sometimes when a family relationship thing happens. In fact, uh, the wounds caused by our families often hurt more than any other wounds we have in our lives. And they are the wounds that we have a harder time getting over. And Joseph had been hurt by his brothers. But now, at an old age, Joseph is about to die. He looks back at his life. He feels the hurt yet. Yes, maybe. But more than that, he decides he's going to go on and forgive, which he did. Joseph put aside all the hurt that he had in his life with his brothers. He put it aside. And he simply grew through those hurts. He matured through those hurts. We grow when we go through hardship. It simply happens. We mature. Joseph matured in his old age. 
he was able to let go of all that hurt that he experienced with his family, with his brothers. He simply went on. Now, the Apostle Paul talks about that a lot too in Scripture, about the hardships that we all have to go through and how we can grow through those hardships. One place is 1 Corinthians 13, no, 1 Corinthians 3, 5, where Paul writes this, Our sufficiency is not from ourselves, but is from God. In other words, hardships have a tendency to force us to put our trust in God rather than ourselves. When we have a problem, when we're hurt by a family member or by others, and we try to fix it, or we try to even help ourselves get over it, we find out we can't do it on our own. And so we begin to look around to see, how, how am I going to deal with this? And then we find God, who we're able to hang on to. And we begin to learn that we can hang on to God and that God is the one that helps us through these hardships. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. The second thing is, if we want our, our life to count, we also need to take, have grace to live by. To have grace to live by. And we see this so prevalent in Joseph's life. In fact, this reality stands out that he lived by grace. And by grace we mean he chose to live in, in, in compassion, in kindness, in love for his brothers rather than hate. Let's go back and let's read again a part of uh, Genesis 5. Let's go to verse 18. Joel, you want to read that please? His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. He spoke kindly to them. Now that's grace for you. They never spoke kindly to him. And yet here, as he's dying, Joseph is speaking kindly to them. Grace. That's the word. He had grace toward his brothers. You know, we live in an imperfect world. And we live with imperfect people. We all do. So we all have to live with grace, right? Grace has to be a big part of our lives if we're going to get along with people. Uh, reminds me of a story. It's a funny one, too. It's a story of this guy who uh, needs a job. And so he's going from house to house, knocking on doors, looking for jobs. So he comes to this one house, knocks on the door. He simply says, you know, I'm looking for a job. I'm willing to do anything just to make a few bucks. Do you have anything for me to do? And the guy who answered the door, the owner of the house, thought a moment. He says, yeah, I've got a job for you. Um, I've got this uh, porch in the back of the yard, and I want you to go out and I want you to paint the porch. And uh, in fact, I'll just go on out with you to the garage and, and get some, some paint for you, some yellow paint, so you can paint the porch yellow. And uh, so he leaves the guy out there, you know, with his, with the yellow paint and the paintbrush. And here, about 45 minutes later, here comes this guy from the backyard to the front yard, knocks on the door again, and he, here he has his paint, and paint all over him, the yellow paint on the, on the, on the the paintbrush <clears throat> and the guy at the house says you're done already I mean you're only out there 45 minutes you're done and you 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 painted the porch and the guy says yes I did and you know your car is not a porch it's a Mercedes <laughs> 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 
Now, people are going to do this kind of stuff to you, not because, not because, you know, uh, they're mean. It's just because some, there are some people who aren't playing with the whole deck. <laughs> you know, they only have half a deck to play with. And besides that, we're all imperfect people. And so we have to have grace. And if we don't have grace toward others, huh, we're in big trouble. And this goes for our marriages. In our marriages, we have to know that we are dealing with imperfect people. There's got to be grace there. Dealing with our families, lots of grace, right? Lots of forgiveness. In a congregation, we need grace here, don't we, to deal with each other. Because we're all imperfect people. We're all sinners. So we need patience with each other. We need grace with each other so that we can get along. We can have peace. We can enjoy life. And that's also how then we begin to make a difference in people's lives. If any of you are struggling with grace this morning um, in your life, struggling perhaps uh, forgiving other people, uh, I encourage you to, to look at your Heavenly Father. Your Heavenly Father was willing to put his own son on this earth in Bethlehem, knowing full well that his son would have a hard life. Your Heavenly Father put Jesus here in this world, even though he knew that he would die on a cross someday. Your Heavenly Father had grace, lots of it, toward you and toward me. And that's why we need grace toward each other. That's why Joseph had grace toward his brothers. That's why he was willing to forgive, even on his deathbed. God was willing to put up with all of us. And not only put up with us, but willing to pay our debt of sin that we owe. So that's the second, <coughs> that's the second thing. There's also a third here in this reading. <clears throat> a third goal. It's a goal to take, it's a goal to, it's, it's going to take a goal to die for. It's going to take a goal to die for. <clears throat> Joel, you want to read that page? <clears throat> Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also, the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. You see, Joseph knew he would die, <clears throat> but he knew he had a goal in his death. He told them that they were going to a better land, a land that God had promised. He also told them that after he died, <clears throat> He wanted them, many years later, to take his bones, Joseph's bones, and take them to the promised land, to the land that God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, they were living in Egypt now. This is where they're at, okay? And Joseph is in Egypt with his, his, his 11 brothers and his father because, and his father, of course, had died, but <laughs> his brothers were still living. And they were in Egypt as slaves, and they were eventually became slaves. Now, <clears throat> were his bones really taken to the promised land? And the answer is, yes, they were. The next year? No. The next decade? No. The next century? Say no. No. 
400 years later, those bones were taken by God's people, Israel, back to the land of promise. Now, do you think that Joseph died with faith? Oh, wow. Faith to believe that someday his bones would be carried to the promised land, and they were. 400 years later. Remember when Moses, Moses came, delivered the Israelites out of their bondage in Egypt. And though, and the, and the first thing that the Israelites did is they took, picked up the bones of Joseph and took them to the promised land. Joseph died in faith. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> there's one truth we have to keep talking about. And that truth is this, that we're all going to die. Each of us. We're all going to die. <clears throat> and I remember when I was a, a little, little guy, I, I remember uh, in the spring of the year when dandelions went and blown. And uh, of course, we always made fun of the nice yellow flowers in our front yard. But those yellow flowers didn't last very long. They became mature, and they became white. And, and I remember going out and taking those dandelions after they were mature and white, and blowing them. Remember, you did that too. You blew them. Those flowers were pretty just a week before. They were in blossom. They were glorious in our front yard. But now, just, and there it went. It reminds us of how fast our lives go. We too are, are we're young, we're in blossom, we're in bloom. Doesn't take long before the gray comes along. And before we know it, our obituaries are in the paper. It happens. It happened to Joseph. It will happen to us as well. Now, you can go to the, all the health clubs you want to. And you can buy all kinds of clothes to try to hide the fact that everything is, is shifting south. <laughs> You can do all these things. You can try to hide everything. But it's going to happen. And God offers all of us a goal. Just like with Joseph, to die for. And the goal that we have is out there. It's a promise. Just like to Joseph it was a promise that he held on to. Someday, God has promised my people that we'll be in that promised land. Yes, I was sold into slavery many years ago in that promised land. I have never been back there, but someday I'm going to go back there again because God has promised. He hung on to that until he died. We hang on to a glorious promise as God's people. A promise of eternity. A place, an experience that God has earned for us in Jesus Christ. That's the goal that we are on. And that's the goal we will have someday. And it's always by faith that we reach out to that. Vacation trips, Porsches, new cars, success at our job, popularity. Lots of money, lots of friends. Those things may all be nice, but poof! Poof, just like with a dandelion. They're all going to be gone. And the only thing of value in the end that we have is a promise. And we die. And we gasp our last breath. We hold on to the promise. Like, Jake, like Joseph did. Someday, God, will take me into his land, into the real promised land. There was a man in Dallas, Texas, uh, who said this, I spent my life raising up the ladder of success only to find out 
that when I reached the top, it was leaning against the wrong wall. It was leaning against the wrong wall. <clears throat> we have a wall that we can lean on. We have a promise that God has given us that we will be with Him in eternity. And that's the goal of our lives. That's the goal. You know, you have a life that counts. You already have a life that counts. It counts for something. It counts because of God and His promise that was given to you in your life. Let's pray about that. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, <coughs> thank you for loving each of us so much. We pray that when we go through hard times, like many of us are right at this time, hardships, that we could all draw near to you and not away from you. Lord, teach us that as we do battle with, with hard times in our life, that our sufficiency is from you, and only from you and not from ourselves. And Father, today we accept from you the grace to live by. And in doing so, we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Help us to forgive in our families. Help us to forgive in our congregation. Help us to forgive in our marriages so that we may live by grace, knowing that we do live with imperfect people all around us. And Lord, we also accept your goal to die for. Goals that whenever everything is said and done, we will not be blown away in a puff that will last forever. <clears throat> Lord, as we move closer to the celebration of Christmas, when you had your own son take on human flesh, and you committed yourself totally to us in our salvation, may we all be motivated to recommit our lives to you and to keep hanging on to that promise you've given to us by faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. <clears throat>